Um, thank you so much, Nazri. And by the way, today happens to be Nazri's birthday. Whoa. So, 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 so thank you so much for, for making your way, um, despite the fact that you know, it's your special day. So I, I guess it makes it, it makes it any more special. I'll just read your profile so that to give some context on, on, on who you are, so that um, uh, whatever it is that is being shared and, and, and the questions that you guys can kind of like derive, uh, you guys will have a better perspective. So Nazri is primarily responsible for the overall strategic direction uh, in the Asia-Pacific region. Vector scorecard uh, suite of application replicates the thinking process of uh, the human brain to analyze information and making decisions. So that's his uh, product. That's the, 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 the holding group that he's working uh, on right now. And I'm sure he'll elaborate further, much better than what I'm doing. The result is a set of comprehensive solutions that help companies to strengthen their future business decisions and strategies with priority factors flagged out of their immediate and long-term attention. So that's interesting. Nasri has garnered more than 10 years of experience and competencies in credit risk, business advisory services, and economic development strategies. In 2006, he founded Vector Scorecard and received government equity funding from Spring Singapore's investment subsidiary. I think that's called SEEDS. Nasri holds an MBA from the University of Western Australia, an accountancy degree from the University of Queensland, Australia, and a diploma in accountancy from Nyan Polytechnic, Singapore. He's also part of the panel of national experts for IFC World Bank, as well as an Asian Development Bank, for providing risk management consultancy work to government agencies, financial institutions, and SMEs in the region. Wow. So without further ado, um, I'll, I'll give to you Nazri Muhammad to talk to us about the future of global economics. Nazri. Thank you very much, Kairu. Very good morning to all. How are you guys feeling this morning? Sleepy, Sleepy inspired, very futuristic in mindset as well as soul. Yeah. So it's very depressing and happy for me today because uh, 50 years from now, I'll be 90 years old. I'll be the same age probably uh, like M.M. Lee if I happen to stay alive. But in any case, um, very happy to be here and uh, it's a very special uh, session uh, which then requires me to emphasize three things, right? First thing is that this is not an economics lecture. So thank goodness you won't fall asleep, okay? And uh, for that, uh, whilst we have to squeeze 15 minutes of presentation to talk about the global economic landscape, it thus becomes very uh, challenging to squeeze everything in 15 minutes and to show you the excerpts of what the economic landscape is going to be like. All right? So there will be some charts, there will be some infographics, uh, there will be some uh, data that I will have to share. Uh, but, uh, you know, due to time constraint, uh, we can only give you the overall key messages and you can always have the slides, I'm sure, from the organizer to go deeper into it, right? Second thing is that this is not an empowerment, motivational talk, okay? So, whilst I'm here to lay out the good and the bad, uh, it's for you to derive some of the ideas, some of the key uh, points, uh, some of the key themes that arise out of the three-part section that I'm going to, uh, three-part presentation that I'm going to share. Right, and uh, third thing is that uh, it's a very important uh, for you to understand uh, the use uh, of data. I mean, before that, I heard about some of you mentioned about connecting the dots, using a lot of data, right, in order to project the future. Okay, talk about how humans should use the technology and not technology use the humans or dictate how the humans should be like. So these are some of the essence that uh, are going to be discussed. Right? And uh, very critical. Now, when you talk about the global futurist, uh, the futurist aspect of what the economy will hold, um, it's very important not to cover everything. There's so many things to talk about, right? I mean, Dr. Tan there talks, will talk about healthcare, you know, what happened to commodity, what happened to food security, yada, yada, you know, so many things. So, for this presentation, I would focus on what matters most to you, what matters most to the younger generation, which is the economy, the business, the workforce, and the skill set, right? And the mindset needed to be done today to deal with the business, the industry, and the economy. So it's top-down and bottom-up approach as we go along, all right? So it's very important to have an open mindset and uh, fasten your seatbelt. We're going to go through this uh, session in a systematic way as, I, uh, as possible. 
So as mentioned earlier, uh, the organizer has uh, given us three parts uh, to discuss. One is insights on the current state of the e global economy. So this is where we get to see the temperature of what's happening in the world in terms of economy. Uh, you must understand the economic cycle before you can even predict the future, right? You, you know what's the economic cycle, right? Any show of hands, anybody who takes economics or study or learn what is economics? Anybody? <laughs> Nobody has learned economics yet, right? How about international business? Uh, uh, what's the profile of, of the crowd here? I know it's quite diverse, right? Okay. So let me then simplify it even further, all right? Let's us simplify and you know, Google for answers later on for background information. Nowadays, use technology, right? Okay, the second part is about uh, the emerging trends in the short, medium, and long term. Again, there are many things to talk about, but we rather focus on how the future of organizations is going to be like. You know, what's Coca-Cola? How was Coca-Cola like then? How is Alibaba now? How's Alibaba in the future? What type of organization is going to work for and your children's education next time? Okay, by then you'll have lots of children and grandchildren, right? So we're talking about Gen Y, Gen X, Gen Z, and then the Alpha generation. So then the millennium people, of course. Okay, so there's a lot of implications on the future of workforce. And of course, the last part will be the key challenges today. We rewind back to the present state, you know, on what and how we will it impact the future if these trends continue to persist in the next 50 years, all right? So now that I've laid out, right, the uh, structure, the flow of the presentation, okay, so we will go through some of these, uh, you know, key points in greater detail. Now, it's important to understand what we do so that you can understand from a practitioner's perspective. So we've been advisors to many, many government agencies, many policymakers in Africa, in Middle East, in Asia. So what do we do with them? We actually help them to plan for the future. Okay, 10-year master plan, 30-year master plan, 50-year master plan, all right? Master plan means it's like the, econ the architecture of the future economy. So when we tackle the global economy, we'll see the direction that they want to do. They have their own country plans, right? They want to build infrastructure, they want to build roads, they want to build a better education system, they want to get expertise from all over the world to, to model themselves after Singapore, for example. Okay, so every region, every country in every region will have some kind of aspiration, okay, as a country, okay, and when presidents change hands, they will start to think of future, all right? They start to think of how to win votes, how to transform the economy, how to create more jobs for the people. But what is happening right now is that things are changing. Things are changing rapidly across all the globe, okay? And this is where we are going to share with you from a practitioner's perspective. Okay, this is where planning forward is top priority for these governments. Okay, and uh, from what angle? So different countries have different priority. Now, before we can even predict the future, and for you to create very profound ideas, very intriguing, thought-provoking ideas in your papers, you need to understand the economic cycles first. Okay, what is the contraction phase? What is the expansionary phase? What's the recessionary phase? Is it structural or is it frictional? Is it cyclical? Right. So all these things, in order for you to put up some uh, perspectives, you've got to be familiar with these terms. Now, knowing the economic cycles help us to do a few things. Okay, when economy is down, right, government needs to spend more, right? Government needs to spend more to create jobs, like in recent cycles in Singapore. Okay, because of the crisis in 2009, you know, 10, we create the first program. We spend money. The government spends money. The government gives money to make sure that people upgrade themselves, etc., etc. Okay, in the US, they start building infrastructure and sometimes countries go to war just to encourage spending. Okay, we are still in the basic stage. Eh? So it's important for us to know that governments use interest rates, government use money supply, government uses... Uh, basically, uh, fiscal spending, okay, to basically spur the economy. So again, in Africa, okay, there are plans for them to build up the infrastructure, but they have little money. Most of the African nations have limited money, so they have to raise money. To raise money, they have to have the right credit rating or country rating. 
to raise the right to have the right rating, they have to make sure their balance sheet is good. Okay? So it's about the financial health check that every country needs to take care of before they can undertake any monetary or fiscal policies. Second is to identify opportunities. When you look at things that are going downhill, there will always be opportunities, right? So in your papers, you've got to identify in a contractionary stage, in a recessionary stage, what type of businesses are, are able to give opportunities? What kind of industries give rise to opportunities? So the next slide gives you a certain uh, graphics on how the various economic cycles gives rise to different opportunities in different industries. That slide will be useful for you to identify and go deeper, right? Of course, through economic cycles, we can make mistakes. Are we overspending? Are we overborrowing? Are we over saving? You know? So from there, we basically can understand what went wrong, what didn't work right. And therefore, over the years, over the past 30, 40 years, the economic cycles are getting shorter and shorter. Okay? Shorter and shorter means that from 8 to 10 years, it becomes 6 to 8 years. Now, it becomes 3 to 5 years, average of 4 years. Okay? The, the peaks and the troughs, right? the cycles, the peaks and the troughs of the cycles are getting shorter and getting more predictable, but getting more volatile. Okay? And a lot of decoupling exists. Okay? Doesn't mean US goes down, means the rest of the world goes down too, other than Singapore, right? Because China and India will pick it up. Doesn't mean China goes down, okay, US will go down too. US has its own economy. So an appreciation of how the situation now, okay, in terms of economic perspective is very critical. There's a lot of decoupling, D-E-C-O-U-P-L-I-N-G, a lot of decoupling exists and that forms part of the cycle. That forms part of how unpredictable sometimes the economic cycle is, as predictable as it is in terms of timeline. So this diagram shows you the uh, curve, right? When it's expanding, when it's rising, when it's contracting, okay, when it's dropping, when it's deteriorating, which sectors within the green box will thrive? Okay, so when you put up ideas in a recessionary state, in an expansionary state, through the 50, next 50 years, there will always be four uh, year cycle that keeps on repeating itself, right? And probably even shorter as people get more intelligent, as countries get more, uh, what do you call that, uh, uh, you know, alert on you know, the mistakes that they've made. So here you can see a combination of industries uh, happening, okay, a couple of industries, movements happening, a couple of uh, dynamics when it comes to stock prices, bond prices, commodity prices, inflation. So try to understand, you know, the behavior uh, of the economics, of the components of the economy, yeah? So this diagram will give you a one page, no need 30 pages, no need 100 pages of economics, yeah? just one page. Try to understand from a layman perspective how certain industries move as they go through various types of expansion and how certain behaviours of the economic components will behave, right? So predicting, the message that I'm trying to say here is that when you want to predict the future, when you give ideas around the future that you are trying to build or, or, or predict, right? You've got to cover this part, okay? You've got to understand the movements of the industries and the cycle. So just to give you an idea, which countries are going through what stage of expansion or retraction or uh, uh, reduction or uh, recession? Okay, uh, Greece is going through early stage recovery following the debacle, right? US is going through mid-stage growth. Turkey is going through late stage expansion after the crisis and Ukraine is going through a recession and so do parts of Russia. Okay, so again, I'm here not to bore you with uh, statistics but here just goes to show how different countries in different parts of the region move differently. It's very, very important that the youth today understand what's happening out there beyond Singapore because Singapore, as you know, is extremely vulnerable to economic conditions, right? Extremely susceptible to what's happening outside. That's the broad message that I want to emphasize in this slide. And here shows you an infographics in terms of the different heat or different color codes to reflect which countries are at risk, which, con which countries are expansion mode, which countries are in recovery, and which countries, the red flags, uh, are in recession. Okay? So surely you learn geography, right? Okay. 
So can anybody tell me, give me a shout, okay? Which country faces a lot of recession risk or going through recession right now, based on the unlabeled map that you see? And China is which one? Which color? Okay, China is at risk, right? How about those in recession right now? Okay, good. South America and then Russia, right? At risk will be? Which country? China. Okay, and how about recovery? Just UK? Euro. Okay, I will go for tinier, you know, smaller and smaller shades. Huh? Okay, what else? What else are in blue? What else are in recovery mode? The one here, oops, sorry. How about the ones uh, other than Western Europe? India. India is what color? How about the one on the right? Above, above uh, Mex somebody said Mexico, right? Mexico is in what stage? Recovery, very good. And more importantly is what is in the expansion stage right now? Canada, I heard Australia, Southeast Asia, so what, what are we saying here, okay? Knowing the big picture is very important because they are moving in different phases, as you can see now. When they move in different phases, what will happen? The companies underneath the countries will behave differently, correct? Different companies will emerge. Different industries would thrive or deteriorate, right? All right? So, and within those organizations that operate in those industries and economies, a certain workforce will appear. Workforce means you guys. You guys are entering the workforce, right? 10, 20, 30, 50 years from here. In retirement, retirement mode probably towards the last phase, right? But that's what's happening now. Whatever is happening here is going through what I mentioned, four-year cycles. Four-year cycles that move in different direction across the globe, right? So can you appreciate and understand why it's important for you to know the economic cycles? Why is it important to know which part of the world countries are going through different types of cycles? And what type of organizations will need to operate under what type of conditions, right? And what type of workforce, which means the individuals are needed you know, to excel in this. Okay, so we move on and on and realize that the strength and the power has shifted to China, US, and India uh, in the next 50 years. Okay, so this is important. I took a little bit extra time to discuss part one so that everybody is on the same page, same wavelength, yeah? But the subsequent stages, the subsequent parts, I need to move a little bit faster. Okay, now that you understand what are top three countries by economic dominance, just remember that China will overtake the rest of the world and India will start to emerge. This is a well-researched topic, but this shows how things can change. Okay, since the 1870s. Now, this is important. What is the emerging trend that's happening? In the past, we've gone through industrialization, followed by globalization. Now we are going through digital <laughs> digitalization. Wow, my tongue gets twi twisted uh, these days. And last but not least is about sustainability. Okay, so you've seen how Ford Motors, Toyota used to champion the industrialization age. Coca-Cola do the globalization stage. Amazon and Google going through the digitalization stage. And now, question mark. No, Alibaba, for all its prowess, are now going to environment, trying to move into you know, wildlife, protection, amongst others. Sustainability is a buzzword these days. So underneath there, the type of workforce you will see, baby boomers, Generation X, Y and Z, and Alpha appearing. So now we are going towards the organization side. We've known the economic cycles. We've known how industries will move in terms of across the economic phases. Now we talk about the type of organizations that will appear. Okay, so have a deep thought about this during your discussion on what the future organization would place an emphasis on and what type of people it comprise of. 
So economy is a function of how businesses operate. Okay, minus the grammar, but how businesses operate. Okay, so these are the kind of implications that will happen. Businesses will have to move into a cheaper place, become more automated, higher up the value chain, amongst others. Okay, and for that, the key challenges today which will impact the future, when you see the industries move, when you see the businesses move, okay, three things that appear. Okay? Sense making, they say, while we are dealing with big data analytics, right? our firm does that a lot, but the point we are trying to make is the people that manages or absorbs or carries out the data that has been churned out need to be more sense making, okay? need to have a high degree of social intelligence for the future and need to be novel and adaptive thinking uh, approach when it comes to dealing with uh, you know, the, the, the future needs. Okay? And uh, within the three tenets, here are the te top 10 skills that are needed for the future workforce. This is what you will need to go through in stages of uh, 1 to 10 years, okay, more than 10 to 30 years, and 30 to 50 years. You, this 10 skill set will only get intense, will only get more in-depth and more widely applied as you go through each of these cycle. That means all these 10, will, we, we perceive, we predict that this is likely to persist, but the intensity will grow in these three uh, time brackets, all right? Sense making. So these are called quite self-exploratory, and we can discuss about, about this in the Q&A section, for example. So with that, I would like to end my presentation, okay? And do have a copy of this, I hope, uh, snapshots of it, so that you can complement some of your notes. With that, thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Nazri, for that very insightful discussion and uh, presentation. I think. Uh